This is a reading from Romans 7, 15 through 25. I do not understand what I do. For what I do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I will for, but the evil I do not want to do is this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against me the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Amen. Um, that is uh, not an easy piece of scripture to, uh, to read. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch the little the videos that go out each week. We do one, which the rest of our kids were the stars, Kyle and Haley, where they talked about, it's called T3T, the top three things you need to know every week. Then we have another one uh, called the Tease, which teases the scripture. Uh, and you have to deal with me for about three and a half minutes, so I apologize ahead of time for that. But in it, um, uh, you know, I, I talked about that there are 20... 20 do's in just this piece of scripture. He says do 20 times. Uh, and and uh, it's unlike Paul to have this, uh, he, he, he's, a, he's a wordsmith, and he's very cognizant if he'd be repeating 20 words. It's not a good wordsmith to not be mixing it up and trying things. So he is definitely wrestling. He's being very honest. He's being very truthful. He's being very raw. He's not allowing himself to sound polished. Paul's a very smart man. He's well-educated. He was a Pharisee. He, he was well-educated in a good school, and he would have been cognizant that I'm repeating and I sound like I'm doing this to do this, but I do that. And if, as we hear, and what we want to do this morning is follow this scripture that um, in it, Paul is just being raw. He's being autobiographical in his own journey in sin, but in, in, in real time. In real time. And we've got to put ourselves in the context of a first century Jew who was used to the way that you found salvation, the way that you were part of the tribe of Israel, the way that you were part of Israel is that you followed the law. The law was given to us. The law was given to us by God. So we have the law of the Ten Commandments. We have the Levitical laws, the Deuteronomy laws. I mean, from just from Exodus alone, we have these laws. But they're external. And they're about obedience. So what happens when you don't follow the law? You're disobedient. And you feel guilty. You feel you're undeserving. And now you just feel sinful. So now you're whipping yourself over the back. So now what do you do with that? So Paul's like in this midst of saying, listen, I, am, I have literally come to Jesus, seen him with my eyes. He came to me. Um, and I am still losing this battle with sin. I want to do good. I want to be so good. But then I just do something real, real messed up. So talk, Paul talks about that thorn in his side. In this scripture today, we hear him saying, I want to do good, I want to do the law, but then I do this, and that's not the law, and I feel bad, so how do, is this sin that's my problem? Is it me that's my problem? And I think we all wrestle with that. How many people have done Curcio here? Anyone? So Curcio, every time I talk to them who've done Curcio, they come back like they're on some spiritual high. You know, it's like a, uh, it's a retreat, you know, it's a spiritual retreat. Um, or maybe you had a really good Bible study, or maybe you've been studying Scripture with your family or with your spouse, and you're feeling like, wow, God is really working through me. You've been praying a bunch. Uh, you've been feeling, and then later that week, 
Maybe you get a call from like your sibling or from someone who just knows how to push your buttons. And, they, and next thing you know, you're getting a little irritable. Next thing you know, you're raising your voice. Next thing you know, you're starting to drop a couple F-bombs. <laughs> and now you're getting real angry. And then you just lose it. And then you're on the phone with them, yelling at them, going like this, going off. And then you hang up the phone and you're like, ah! And you're like, what is going on with me? I thought I was being so holy. I thought I was on this path. I thought I was making so much progress in my Christian walk. I thought I was leaving behind this old life. And my gosh, I'm embarrassed how I just acted. And often that happens to the people we love the most, because sometimes the people we love the most, we treat the most poorly, right? We'll go off, we'll lose our cool. Um, why is that? That's what Paul is wrestling with today. And, and we continue the sermon series. We're working our way through Romans. And last week was Romans 6, and we came to the uh, um, conclusion of, well, the overall title of the sermon series for July is, Who Do You Want to Serve? Last week we talked about that. The idea, the first two questions you've got to ask yourself is, who are you and whose are you? And last week we talked about, well, who do you want to serve? Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve sin? Because Paul is making a statement, it's that obvious, it's just that straightforward. When you wake up in the morning, you've got to be cognitively be in line with the divine mind, not the mortal mind. The mortal mind is going to say you're going to screw up, you're going to make mistakes, it's bad, whatever, just live for yourself, be a survivalist. The divine mind is saying, wait a minute, no, I, I serve only one God. I don't serve idols, I serve the one and true Lord. We have to ask ourselves that all the time. Who am I serving today? But before we get to serving our Lord, the number one question we've got to ask, though, and today Paul is asking us, who are you? You've got to know, understand yourself first. You've got to really claim your own identity as a human being. And Paul is taking us all the way back to Eden. And we have to understand our roots. Our roots as human beings, that the, one of our first great acts that we did was disobey God. This is where we get the original sin. This is where we come to the grips that, that, that like in Wonder Woman, I talked about this before, I know you guys don't like that movie, I love the movie, I don't know why you guys don't like it, but I liked it a lot. Has anyone seen it yet, Wonder Woman? Okay, good, okay. Comes to the realization that we're, she can't save them. We're all infected with this evil. It's just part of, of our, of, our, of our instincts as human beings. You hear rules, say, hey, you got to follow this rule, right? Carla tells her daughter, don't do this. And the first thing that Carla's daughter is like, well, actually, maybe I should do it. That might be kind of cool. No, you're a really good kid. You don't do it. But we do that as human beings sometimes, right? We, just, we talked about that last week. Our, our natural inclination is to break rules. Why is that? Well, a lot of people would say it goes back to Eden. It's just naturally, it's a part of ourselves. And if we don't accept that and say, you know what? By myself, on my own, left to my own devices, I'm going to be pretty darn sinful. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to uh, uh, make choices based on my own needs. Uh, I'll go back to our roots as human beings of just being a survivalist, just being an exclusivist. Uh, I have a tendency sometimes to hurt others. I don't mean to. I can be lustful. I can be really impatient. Uh, and these are my secrets. Because in the church sometimes, it's not okay to bear those sins. So we tuck them away and we hide those sins that we have. We don't want anyone to see them, right? Because we're holy people. But we watch and we listen to Paul who's wrestling with this sin that's just tearing him apart. And we realize he comes to the conclusion that finally two-thirds through, two, through the scripture, he just says, wretched man that I am. Wretched man that I am. I got no power over this sin. He tries to blame it on sin. He tries to blame it on the law. And finally, two-thirds through it, after about 18 dues, he finally says, wretched man that I am. This body of death. And that's low. That's rough. A lot of us left denominations because that's all we heard about ourselves. But, but I think we got to go there. We have to go there for a brief second, at least for chapter 7 of Romans, and allow ourselves to go into the deepest, darkest parts of our own soul, where our deepest sin is, where our deepest lusts are, where our deepest um, hurt is, pain is, insecurities. we got to go there because there's no way that God's going to be able to come in and rebuild you and restore you unless you're completely honest and authentic with God. You guys know I love the 12-step program. <laughs> Uh, I love AA because every time I walk into an open meeting at AA, 
the transparency and the authenticity is just powerful. Because you can't get anywhere as a drunk unless you are ready to admit that you are powerless over alcohol. You got nothing. There's no way you're going to get sober without it. And I think Paul's asking us to have that same kind of understanding of our own sin. If we think that we can do this Jesus thing by just being part-time lovers of Jesus, by allowing him into our hearts sometimes, by just maybe dabbling here and there with our faith, you'll lose the battle with the devil every time. Sin is going to get you every time. You're getting in that argument with, with a loved one or with a stranger, and your cool is going to be lost every single time if you think you control that. But if you can sit there and know and give over your sin to God and say, but you, God, are in control here, not me, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a much better chance of God cooling you out and saying, okay, let's take a different approach here. Knowing who you are by yourself, left to your own devices, but when I give myself over to God, knowing whose you are can change your heart and your mind and transform you day in and day out. My mother is one of the smartest women that I know. I'm sure every child says it's about their parents, um, but I truly believe it. Uh, and throughout my youth, big corporate attorney, very successful. Uh, great mother. But she had a secret. Right? She was a drunk. I didn't know it. My sister didn't know it. She kind of, you know, was on, you know, she drank. When she got all her work done, she was in control. She was behind closed doors. And that was her, kind of her medicine, right? And one day, I asked her about this, and I asked her if I could tell the story, obviously. She said, yes. <laughs> um, she came home, and she had been running that morning. She came home, and of course she was hungover, sweating profusely, and she's sitting there at the kitchen table. Her hands are just shaking, right? Shaking uncontrollably. And she'd been dealing with this for about, you know, 20 years. And she heard a voice. She heard a voice from God who said, you're a drunk. What are you going to do about it? No one, no little cure-all that just said, you're sober. No saying, I'm going to heal you. Just, you're a drunk. Those are the words she heard. And she had a choice. Do I finally be honest with myself and know that I'm completely powerless over this, this disease that's inside of me, that I have no control over this? Or do I keep on denying it? Being like, I got this. No, I can do this. I can lower the allowed. I can make, I can make it happen. I've been successful in my career. I can do this. I'm fine. I'm a good mother. It hit her like a ton of bricks. Just so much honesty and authenticity just waved over this lie that she had been living that says, I can control this. I can control this. Finally, thing, the divine voice saying, you are a drunk. You have no control. She never took a drink again. That was 30 years ago. 30 years sober. She said she's never felt closer to God than ever before than once she got sober. Because there was this wall, even though my mom almost became a nun, clearly it didn't work out, but she was like, almost became a nun. A very, <laughs> very holy woman. I'm, you know, my, my, I, I attribute a lot of my call to just following in the footsteps of my mother. Um, very holy woman, generous, giving, loving. You would not understand that she was wrestling with the disease, but she uh, had, this, had this barrier there, this barrier between getting closer, more intimate with God, and it was, it was the booze. And when she finally came clean, it was just honest with herself, a woman who was so controlled, the woman who was one of the first women to go to be um, a law school student at her law school, a woman who broke barriers, who, who, who was, did not show weakness, who was successful, who did well, still had this barrier that was holding her back. And once she was finally honest and said, God, you are right, I am a drunk, heal me, redeem me, restore me. And now she feels closer to God she's ever had. She's had a whole new second career. And she became now that, well, I'm going to go on, and I love my mom, so I won't go on. But she's had a whole second career, second vocation, and just a different approach to it in the library system of, of academic libraries, and just her heart just going nuts now. But I can't imagine how fearful and scary that moment was when God tells you that. And I think that's what Paul gets to at the end of this letter. 
of that kind of honesty and authenticity is what God calls for us to follow him. That if we're not honest with him and say, left to my own devices, Lord, I'll cruise the internet at night and go into places I shouldn't go. Left to my own devices, God, I'm going to turn to my anger and say some real stupid things. Left to my own devices, God, I'm probably going to make some pretty bad choices out there. Instead of having two, I might have three or four drinks, and I'm going to wake up in the morning and be like, what did I do last night, right? There is, left to our own devices, it can get pretty rough out there. Not all the times. But Paul leaves us with this final note at the end of this chapter 7, which is a rough one. He says, but thanks be to God for Jesus Christ in my life. And if you come back next week, we dip into chapter 8, which is the real good news. <laughs> because what Paul is getting at now is that I have been restored and renewed by inviting Jesus to take over my whole heart. It's like when Bruce Lee would have his students, the first thing he would do is give them a cup of water and said, this is your life right now. This is all of your experiences. These are all your perceptions of yourself and of this world. This is all your weaknesses, all your strengths. Everything you think you know about yourself is in this cup. But if you really want to be my student, you want me to be your master, you want me to teach you how to be the brilliant martial artist you can be, you need to take that cup right now and turn it over. And that's what his students would do. Like a mini baptism. That's our baptism. Empty ourselves out completely in front of God. Put all your weakness. When we walk inside these doors, we say, God, I am a sinner left to my own devices. I'm going to screw it all up. I'm a wretched person. However, being baptized into the glorious water of God, by accepting you into my heart, not an external law, but an internal relationship, by falling more deeply and deeply in love with you every single day of my life, for every time I feel a temptation, I know who really owns my heart. Not sin, but God who loves me, who's going to give me every tool, every gift, everything that I need. For every time I have an insecurity, I don't listen to that insecurity. I listen to what God says about me, who loves me, who's got full control of me, who adores me, who wants me to do great things for him. For every time I feel a temptation to do something I shouldn't do, I'm not on my own. I don't have to sit there and wrestle with it. I say, God, I am claimed by you. I am a child of God. Give me the power to overcome this. I worship a God who defeated death. I could worship a God who could defeat sin. You got to remind yourself that when you're going down a rough road. You worship a God who defeated death. What can he defeat in your life too? He will give you the victory. That's why he died on the cross. Sin is defeated. Jesus is the victor. But we know and understand that victory when we fully empty ourselves out. Be honest with our sin. The darkest places of our spirit, the darkest parts of our sin, our lusts, our angers, whatever it may be that you can keep hidden from others, and say, God, I'm giving this over to you, because I got no control. And he will put that upon the cross. Carry it. Transform our hearts into something more beautiful than we could ever ask or imagine. It takes honesty, authenticity, transparency, and a ton of courage. But God provides everything you need as he constantly, every day, restores and redeems us to be the beautiful children of God that we are. So this week, what do you want to empty out? Where's that dark place that maybe it's just you know about? Maybe your spouse, too. What are you going to reveal to God? What are you going to empty out for God to come in and redeem you? And chapter 8 is next week, and we'll learn all about the renewal in the Spirit which is a good one for the U2 one, because you might have a lot of guests. So it's good that it wasn't this week with a lot of guests. They'd be like, whoa, this church is crazy. So <laughs> let us all stand, and we're going to say together the Nicene Creed. <laughs>